Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Mary's this beautiful morning. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today, both in person and online. I want to once again thank or welcome Pastor Bill Rumball and express our sincere appreciation to him as he leads the service in Pastor Sam's absence. At this time, I invite everyone to prepare their hearts and minds for worship as we enjoy Mary Ann's prelude selection. Please stand and join in the call to worship. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. The beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. Please remain standing to join in and sing hymn number 90, which can be found in the Blue Chalice Hymnal. Come, Christians, join to sing.
Let us pray. O oh Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that we may know and understand what things we ought to do. Give us grace and power to faithfully accomplish all you have called through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Um, I think this person needs no introduction, but our special music today is by Doug Seif. So, Doug? Well, then why'd you do it anyway? <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I hope you all had a happy, joyous fourth and a safe one. This is a song that I thought was appropriate. It's called American Christian. country was founded by a few godly men and I as a Christian I have rights I'll defend I love America and I love Jesus too every night on my knees I ask the Lord please God bless the red, white, and blue I'm an American Christian Born in the U.S. of A American Christian Born again by God's grace I thank God for my country Where I can work and pray American Christian loving my Jesus in the U.S. of A I'm an American Christian born in the U.S. of A American Christian
may God bless America and God bless our service personnel wherever they be serving. Um, the Old Testament readings today this comes from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 40 through 49. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does does not save by sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. The responsive reading today is taken from Psalm chapter 115, verses 1 through 13. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name, give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. The nation. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. They have mouths, but do not speak, eyes, but do not see. They have hands, but do not feel, feet, but do not walk. They make no sound in their throats. O oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The epistle reading today is taken from Matthew chapter 14 verses 13 through 21, and can be found on page 16 of your pew Bible. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a des deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so they, so they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and all who ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full, and those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Here ends today's reading.
Well, good morning again, St. Mary's. It's, it's great to be back with you this Sunday, and, uh, we're, and with the, uh, thank, I'm thankful for the opportunity to, to fill in for uh, Pastor Sam as he and his family are getting some time away, some well-deserved time away. And uh, it's just it's great to, to see people that I got a chance to meet last week. Some folks are, uh, you haven't met yet, but it's just great to be here with you this morning. You know, pastors, um, I don't know if you know this, but pastors actually often get asked, you know, how are you... Where do you get your inspiration for sermons? How do you come about with, you know, what you're going to talk about? You know, that sort of thing. And, and I'll tell you right now that I understand that the pastorly answer, if I'm asked that question, the pastorly answer is for me to say that, that I am inspired by Scripture, that God sends a light on the Bible when I open it, and he shows me what to talk about. Now, that is the pastorly answer, but I've never actually had that happen. I have felt inspired by what God wanted me to talk about, but I haven't had the whole light and violins playing and that sort of thing. Uh, today's message, actually, I was inspired or, or kind of, you know, it piqued my interest when I, I read a book by one of, my, you know, one of my favorite authors. His name is, is a gentleman by the name of Malcolm Gladwell. Some of you may know Malcolm Gladwell. He's a, uh, uh, he's a pro prolific writer and uh, he wrote a book not long ago entitled, strangely enough, David and Goliath. And the idea that he puts forth in this book, and the reason I found it so interesting and wanted to talk about it today, is he puts forth this idea that maybe some of what we have thought about the story of David and Goliath is wrong. We have talked many times, and if, you know, it's taught in, in uh, Sunday schools, it's taught in, in Bible study. We've all, we know the story of David and Goliath, and, and I have preached about it from the, the standpoint of, of, of David standing up to the mighty Goliath and him defeating him and, and, and that, and, and David was, was the underdog in this great battle. But what Malcolm Gladwell puts forth, and what I'd like to say to you is that maybe we're thinking about it the wrong way. There are actually some scholars that believe uh, that Goliath was at a significant disadvantage. Uh, he was a giant, yes, he, but he obviously moved very slowly. Uh, in the scripture that we just heard, it tells us that he said, come over here so that I can fight you. He, he wasn't going to go chasing down David. He was saying, come on over here, get closer so I could get my hands on you. He also, uh, some scholars believe that he also possibly uh, had some issue with his eyesight uh, because he says in there, what, what are you, uh, am, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? But there's no mention of David having sticks. He, he has a, a staff, but he doesn't have like a bunch of sticks or anything like that. And so Goliath wants David to come closer so he can see him better and he can get his hands on him. But we know the story, David... And the skills and the experience that he has, being a shepherd and, and uh, defending his sheep against you know, lions and bears and whatever else was out there. And the skills that he had, he uses those to defeat Goliath, but he also does so with the power of God. And so the premise here is, what if we're thinking about things incorrectly? What if we grab on to the fact that if David fought Goliath with the power of God, he could in no way be an underdog in that fight. Because if we have the power of God, whatever we do, whether it's large or whether it's small, if we do it with the power of God, it has to be effective. See, there's a lot of references in Scripture to things that are small or less than what society would think was right. Uh, in scripture, we, we, we hear uh, the gateway to life is narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. It talks about that narrow gate or that narrow roadway, smaller. We heard the story where Jesus says, how much bread do you have? And they reply, just seven loaves and a, and a few fish. And he feeds the multitudes. We hear the story of when a, a poor widow dropped in just two small coins, the widow's mites, just two tiny coins, and how Jesus calls our attention to that. And in Luke, we'll read, The Lord answered, If you have faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this tree, may, may it be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. 
And then one of my favorite parts or one of the things that I enjoy the most about reading about Jesus is when, when we, we hear uh, the people were displeased because he has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. Time and time and time again, Jesus is seen to be hanging around those or hanging out with those that are less than what society would have said was worth it. Kind of turning the tables. And in Revelation we'll read, it is time to judge the dead and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people and all who fear your name from the least to the greatest. And as we just read in Psalm 115, he will bless those who fear the Lord, both the great and lowly. Our society, our country, our world values great big stuff. The bigger the better. Social media has got us to the place where we're constantly comparing ourselves to others. But we have to recognize and embrace the fact that not everything's the same. God loves diversity. Every snowflake is different. Uh, astronomers state that in the cup of the Big Dipper, if you go out and look at the Big Dipper, in the, in the cup part of the Big Dipper, scientists estimate that there are at least a million different galaxies contained within that. God loves that we're different, and he wants us to act that way. But see, we know because we're human and society is made of humans, with differences come judgments. People will begin to say that one thing is better than another. And in a way, you know, we've got to admit some of that's right. It's difficult sometimes to admit that some people are superior in some way. Let's get this out of the way first. When I was a kid growing up, I grew up in western Pennsylvania. And my dream as a young boy was to play second base for the Pittsburgh Pirates. But I can't hit a curveball. And I just was never that good. There was always somebody better. And that's the way it is. We hold on to the fact <clears throat> that in our country, in our society, we believe that all are created equal and we should fight for that to always be true. But in reality, it just isn't always that way. There's always somebody who's, in my case, faster or, or better or stronger or whatever. But superior in that way does not mean more significant. The Bible claims we matter, that we're God's dream come true. Let that settle on you just for a moment this morning. Allow that to, to just, just take root in your soul that you are God's dream come true. That scripture tells us that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. It may be difficult at times to showcase our differences because they might, we might feel they make us look less than others, but we need to be okay with our differences being seen. In the book of Genesis, we read that after they had eaten the forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve covered themselves. But they didn't cover their mouths, even though they sinned with their mouths. They didn't cover their hands, even though they used their hands to sin. They covered the parts that made them different. Their sin caused them to be ashamed of their differences. And sin makes us afraid to show our differences, because our differences invite judgment. And we fear being judged inferior in some way. But what if differences are good? What if God intended for there to be some of us that are more and some that are less in some way, some that are more flashy and some that are more ordinary, some that can play second base and some that can't? But maybe a big part of faith is refusing to accept the judgment that others place on us because of our differences. When we accept judgment from other people, a lot of damage is done. We fear that we're not good enough. But let's make sure that we understand right here and right now that that is precisely who Jesus called to follow him. 
the not good enoughs. The not good enoughs. On some level, we all need to be needed and appreciated and loved. It's a basic feeling, but what if we consider that our worth is not tied to what other people think? Who's to say that others' judgments are accurate anyway? Humans want to believe that there's always something that's the best. This, in a couple of days, Major League Baseball is going to have the, the all-star game where they'll be celebrating those that are the best. But those that are the best, if they're good and they're good teammates and they're smart, they know that they didn't get to that game without other people on their team. That there are other people on their team that are not represented there, that are just as significant in their role. But we make judgments. And we allow other people to make judgments. Think of the idea of, of beauty. The ideal beauty changes with time. King Solomon had a thousand wives. He spoke of a harem filled with the lights of the heart of men. In Song of Solomon, he describes his favorite one, but the idea of beauty changes. Some of you, I know some of you are, are of the age where you can remember like I can, where in the 1960s, a model by the name of Twiggy changed the idea of beauty forever. But now, in our society, now the scruffy look is in for men. Who would have thought that 10 or 12 years ago, because of a television show about some guys that mostly like to fish and hunt frogs in Louisiana, would change what's acceptable for men to, to wear? It's now more acceptable for guys to have long beards because the idea has changed over the years. The truth is, all people are beautiful. And the judgment of best changes from generation to generation and from culture to culture. As followers of Jesus Christ, it's not our differences that we should dwell upon. We should celebrate the fact that we've been created that way. We've been designed that way for service to Jesus Christ. And that is one of the most difficult things, I think, for all of us to really grasp, that how we were created in all of our imperfections, in all of the stuff that we deal with, we were created exactly that way to be used by Jesus Christ, to be of service to him, it's certainly appropriate to try to improve ourselves, but we do so to the glory of God and to influence other people for him. We sometimes, oftentimes, confuse significance with prominence. Significance is having meaning. Prominence is simply being easily seen. The celebrity world is full of people that are prominent. But I say to you today, I don't think there's all that many that are significant. America loves idols. We believe and, and on times worship the stick out rich, the, the famous, the stick out talented people. Being big is what matters. And if that's true, we couldn't grasp being small and and also significant. Sadly, I'm, I think many churches are like that too. The three largest churches in America are one in Houston with over 43,000 members, another in, another in Houston with 20, almost 24,000, and one just outside of Atlanta, Georgia with 23, 24,000 members. Nothing against those churches, but as numbers that come on Sunday, what it's all about, I would say no, that relationships with Jesus Christ and each other are what God has designed for his people. It's coming to church on Sunday morning and seeing somewhere or some pew is empty and the person that usually sits there isn't there and you wondering about them and checking on them to see if they're okay. Being God's church is not about how many people come to that church, it's about how many people feel at home 
in that church when they come. Does prominence really rule? There's lots of things that are insignificant, inconspicuous rather, but also significant. Scripture talks about the fact that, you know, my, my hands are more conspicuous than my liver, but I can't live without my liver. My eyes are more conspicuous without, than my lungs, but we can't live without lungs. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that some parts of the body that are weakest and the least important are actually the most necessary. God gives great honor to that which is less prominent. What if God looks at us that way? That the churches, the people that are not the, the, the ones that get all of the attention are the ones that God says they're doing my work. Small fits when big doesn't. That's why anybody that, that mows their, their lawn with a tractor, a lawn tractor, also has a push mower to mow around the flower beds. Because if you mow with the tractor, you may accidentally mow over some of the flowers. <laughs> Come on, I know I'm not the only one. <laughs> Small fits where big doesn't. If you try to use that tractor with a big deck, you're either going to miss some or you're going to hit some. Think about how you feel when you meet someone that you consider larger than life. You, have, you might have a tendency to feel less than amazing. But God's put amazing people on the earth, larger than life people. But they don't fit everywhere. Look at advancements in technology. When I was in college, I took a class in computer programming. And this was a number of years ago that I took this class in computer programming and the computer that we put all of our information into to run the actual program, the computer itself at that time would probably fill about half of this sanctuary, just the computer. And, I, and I'm, I'm, all, I'm on the subject, I'm going to go ahead and say this, and I, I get it, somebody in here is going to know what I'm talking about. When we wrote the computer program, we used something called key punch cards. Anybody know those? There was little cardboard cards, and then, you know, eventually when we stopped using those, you had thousands of them in an office, and you used them to write notes or whatever on we use those, but think of the advancement in technology. That computer that would take up half of this sanctuary probably would not do the work that that thing in your pocket right now can do. People that work in computers have discovered that the small things that now we use are actually more difficult to make. They would tell you that the bigger things were easier for them to make. The smaller stuff is tougher. But what about us? Think about it. God's perfect. We recognize it. God's perfect. So wouldn't it be easier, and I'm not saying God has things that are hard, but just bear with me. Wouldn't it be easier for God to make something because he's perfect, it would be easier for him to make something perfect. Doesn't that make sense? It would be easy for him to make something that was perfect. It's, uh, there was a, there's a movie that was out uh, several years ago. It's one of my, my kids' favorite movies, and we watch it too. It's called School of Rock. And I'm not kidding, you don't have to go watch it or anything like that. But one of the actresses in the movie had to sing, uh, had to pretend that she couldn't sing. She had a she, her character had a terrible voice, and she sang and she had to sing out of key. But the actual actress has a wonderful voice. And so for her part, she had to sing poorly. And what trained singers will tell you, to sing poorly on purpose is not easy. So wouldn't we think about it, if God is perfect, wouldn't it be easier for him to make perfect things? Think about it. If, if someone came up here and, and dumped a bucket, bucket of water over my head, which is easier, 
from, for me to get completely soaking wet or for them to dump a bucket of water over my head and only one drop hit me. It would be a lot harder for the one, just one drop to hit me with all of that water. Well, what about when God created us, what if God took extra care in making each one of us imperfect? What if he took extra care in making us imperfect? The creator of the universe, all-powerful and all-knowing, created someone who can't sing or dance in front of other people, who, who can't hit a curveball and was not going to play professional baseball. Isn't that a miracle that the creator of the universe, the all-perfect, all-knowing God, created those of us imperfect? In modern warfare, we're constantly trying to make bigger bombs, but scientists finally discovered the greatest power was in the smallest, the atom. Maybe it's possible that our churches, big church, the churches in the world are wasting time looking for the next Billy Graham or the next Mother Teresa or the next Martin Luther King. And maybe we should be striving to see and unleash the power and the moms and the dads and the regular people that are sitting down the pew from you or in front of you or behind you. The people that God has made imperfect. The people that God has made imperfect. The story of Ruth in the Old Testament is one such story. Ruth's husband dies and she pledges to stay with her mother-in-law Naomi. She says, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay, and your people will be my people, and your God, my God. And they get to Israel, and they're poor, and they're hungry, and Naomi asks Ruth to marry a man twice her age just to survive. Ruth then gives birth to Obed. Is that the end? No. Ruth turns out to be the great-grandmother of David. David. David and Goliath who slays the giant through the power of God. Can you imagine Ruth and David meeting in heaven? Imagine what that would look like. I'm sure that Ruth was shocked when she saw how all that turned out. But what if this is how God operates? What if he loves to weave the amazing from the unspectacular? Maybe that's what we're called to faith in to see and be suspicious about what is God doing in our lives and through the lives of people that maybe are imperfect, that aren't the prominent, that are absolutely significant. Some of the most important things in history are done in secret, covertly. The CIA, the FBI, the NSA all find power in secrecy their agents don't have a public face. But what if God places believers all around, all over the world, and there are no not onlys with God, that no one is ever just a teacher, no one's ever, ever just a truck driver, they're never just a retiree, they're never just a this or just a that. Because what if we're all called to use the power of God that David used to do in Acts what Paul is told on the road to Damascus when Jesus spoke to him and said, I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn darkness to light. Each of us plays a role in God's story. It's not the other way around. An actor who doesn't accept a minor role in a play can sabotage the play. Success and fulfillment in our life should be based on finding the position designed for us by God. God says he will bless those who fear the Lord, both great and lowly. Some are amazingly talented, bright stars, stars while others are maybe bit part actors. But it makes no difference as long as both are essential. I believe that to, 
your VBS starts tomorrow, isn't that correct? Is VBS coming up? It's coming up, right? Understand and embrace the fact that with the power of God, just like with David, with the power of God, the impact that you will make on the children that come to VBS and the families of the children that come to VBS is, can never be considered insignificant in what God has deemed important. God calls us because we are his creation. We may all be different. We all have different strengths. We all have different weaknesses. We all have different talents. Churches are coming all sizes and shapes. But because we are God's creation, we can never, you cannot possibly ever be insignificant. Never be insignificant. We need in our world to embrace our diversity. The diversity of people, the diversity of talents, the diversity of, of churches, because God has created us that way. And we are called to use what he has given us, whatever it is, for his glory. And so that others will see the truth and turn from darkness to light. When I was growing up in a church in western Pennsylvania, we had a pastor, a minister we called him. He was, his name was Reverend Gray. And at the end of every sermon, he said the same, he said the same verse. And I'm going to do it here today. One, because this church reminds me a lot of the church I grew up in. But also, I just, whenever we say this, when he would say this, he said at the end of his sermon, and I'll tell you, as a young child, 10, 12 years old, I'd love to tell you what an impact that that verse had on me. But the truth is, when I heard that verse, the sermon was over. <laughs> and Reverend Gray used to stand up there and he would say, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May the same be true today. For all of us. May the same be true today for all of us. Would you now stand and join as we sing hymn number 595 in the Chalice Hymnal?
standing as we affirm our faith together as we repeat the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. You should have in your bulletins uh, some prayer concerns and prayer requests. Um, we have in there the, uh, the family of David Webb, who's a cousin of Kendra Hurd. David passed away on July 4th after a 15-year battle with heart and brain cancer. Family requests prayers for his 16-year-old son, Zachary, daughter, Amanda, son, Stephen, mother, Jane, as well as the entire Webb Poulos family in their time of grief. Maya Niklo was moved to Hershey last Sunday for continued treatment of pneumonia. Ben White, Doug's brother, recovering at home and doing well following a stroke. And Dave Cunningham, a scan showed no new growth or increase in his lesions. He's been placed on steroids for pain and to stimulate his appetite, and he's continuing his immunotherapy. There is one addition uh, we just received this morning, and that is for the family of Andy Holmes, uh, who passed away. Please keep them in your prayers. Would you please join me as we pray for them as, as we pray for our church. Father God, thank you so much for being a God that we can come before you and lay our requests and lay our fears and lay our anxieties down at your feet. Scripture tells us that that is what we are to do. And Father, we, we lift up specifically the family of David Webb as they, as they deal with this. Father, it is... Uh, <clears throat> Passing someone we love, passing is never easy. Please comfort this family as they, as they go through this time of grief. Care for them, love them, let them know that you are there for them. We pray also for Maya as she continues treatment for pneumonia. Father, we, we pray that uh, for the doctors and nurses that will be helping along that way. We pray also for Ben, who's recovering at home, and uh, we thank you so much for him doing better following the stroke. We pray for Dave Cunningham. We know that there, there's no new growth and no increase in lesions, but we know the pain that he is in and his need to, to gain some weight, Father, so that he can be healthy, Father. Continue to care for him and his family. We pray also for the family of Andy Holmes as they are dealing with the grief of him passing. Father, be with them and hold them in your loving arms. Father, pray also for the people here of St. Mary's as they or your light in this community, in this county, in this state, and in our country, and in this world. Father, I ask that you give them the power that you gave David. I ask them that you give them uh, the wisdom, the strength, Father, it takes to do the things you have called them to do. But also I ask you to give them the knowledge that they are loved by the one who created them that they, they are cared for by one who loves them unconditionally. And Father, we pray for their VBS this week, that it will be a, a tremendous time. It will be a time of joy. It will be a time of, of children hearing the word of God. It will be a time when decisions are made, decisions for you, Lord. And Father, we, we pray these things, Father, in the name of the one who taught us, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. with the offering as we stand to sing the doxology.
Please remain standing and join me in the offertory prayer. All good gifts come from you, dear Lord, and from your abundant blessings we bring these offerings. Help us to use it for the furtherance of your purpose in this place and for the benefit of those in need. Amen. Uh, please join us for hymn 545 in the blue chalice. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll be seated just for a couple minutes, I have a couple announcements. Um, the first being the tech sponsorship this week is in honor of Andy Brown's birthday on July 6th from mom, dad, Josh, and Ryan. So happy birthday, Andy. And I want to invite Emily up to talk about VBS. Good morning. Food Truck Party VBS is ready to go. We are so excited to have an awesome week. We have been decorating, we have prepared crafts, uh, lots of people have been prepping that at home. Uh, we have snacks bought, we have uh, skits prepared, we have music practiced, so we are ready to be on a roll with God. 
Got to throw that in there. Um, <laughs> so we are just so thankful for all the volunteers we have this year. We have a great team. Stacy and I are so thankful to have a wonderful team with us. So thank you for all of your time and talents um, that you've already given and that you're about to give this week. But there's plenty for the congregation to do as well. Um, please share the word about our VBS. It starts tomorrow. Monday at 6 o'clock and goes till 8.30, uh, Monday through Friday. It is open to kids who are four years old through completed fifth grade. And we still have room to take on some more kids, so please spread the word. So that's the first thing you can do. The second thing you can do is be in prayer for us. Pray for good weather. Uh, pray for the fridge and freezer to cooperate, which is notoriously a problem VBS week. Uh, pray for our volunteers. Pray for our hands and feet and words. Um, and again, we're just grateful for the time and talents that they're sharing with our kids. And also be in prayer for our VBS kids, uh, that they have a great week, uh, that their hearts and minds are open to God's word, and they feel God's love during this week. So those are the things that you can do to help us out. Uh, so you're still part of our VBS journey, even if you're not with us in the in body this week. Please be in prayer for us. Some thing, other things you can do also is tonight is the ice cream social at 6.30. We are supposed to be outside, but given the weather, if it is not good, we will be in the vestry. Um, so I'm just alerting you, if we, you don't see us in the pavilion or if it's storming, we'll be inside. And this is open to everyone. Whether you're part of VBS or not, this is open to everyone. So please come join us and have a, a great um, time tonight, 6.30 to 7.30, of just some social time and some good ice cream. The other thing is that Kona Ice will be our food truck that is coming on Friday of VBS week. Our VBS uh, kids and volunteers will get to partake in it um, right before VBS. So if you are signed up, um, you should have gotten information that we're going to actually have a meal on Friday at 5 o'clock, and it's going to include Kona Ice. Um, but Kona Ice is also going to be available to the community from 6 to 7, and they're going to be in the auxiliary parking lot. So if you're coming for Kona Ice, please go to the parking across the street. That's where they'll be located, 6 to 7, um, and that's open for the community to come out and purchase some uh, some uh, shaved ice and enjoy that. And with the heat that we've been having, hopefully that's a, a good treat to have. So I think those are all my announcements, I'm looking to my VBS people in case I've forgotten something. So um, thank you all very much. Uh, one of our other upcoming events is Stuff the Bus. That's on July 29th. It's 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Westminster Walmart parking lot. And it looks like they still need staff um, the link, you can go to the link on the website or church center, or if all else fails, call Sabrina. I think she's leading the charge on this. Uh, donations are still being accepted, school supplies, monetary, or script cards through Emily. The deadline for that's July 16th. Um, and just a reminder, there's a congregational meeting on July 23rd following the worship service. And information on that's on the back of the bulletin, or you can contact Kent Kramer if you have any other questions. There's a church cleanup Saturday, July 15th at 8 a.m., so if anybody wants to come out and get their hands dirty, come on out. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Doug, Doug Slate for his special music, and also Pastor Bill for being here for two Sundays to lead services for us in, in Pastor Sam's absence. So I believe that's all the announcements. Taylor? Oh, hang on. All righty, Taylor. <laughs> 